about how much love there is even when everything goes wrong, how much joy there can be even in difficult experiences of parenting. And I think it gave me the, the energy and the conviction that whatever children we had and whatever challenges we faced, we would be able to construct a loving family. He's a writer and lecturer on subjects as wide-ranging as politics, psychology, and the arts. He's an activist in lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender rights, a National Book Award winner in the United States for his groundbreaking book on depression, a condition he lives with himself. His new book, Eleven Years in the Making, has been widely praised as a landmark in defining the relationships between parents and their children. We met Andrew Solomon in New York City. Andrew, when I mentioned to a friend of mine that I was going to be coming to New York to talk to you, she said, oh, you have to see this uh, thing on YouTube uh, where he speaks about going to Africa uh, when he was researching his book on depression. So I went to it, and anybody can do this, so all you have to do is Google your name and up it comes. And I was riveted by this. And I wanted to start by asking you about that, and then, and then we'll backtrack uh, a little bit. But you, went, you were researching this, the well-known book that you've written about depression. You yourself were going through depression. Tell me a little bit about what happened when you went to Africa. A friend of mine was living in Senegal and said, you know, there are interesting tribal rituals for the treatment of depression here in Senegal. And I thought that would be a very interesting perspective to have. And I'd wanted in any case to break down the idea of depression as a modern Western middle class illness. So I thought I would go off and look at how it functioned in various other cultures. So I went to Senegal really hoping to learn about a ritual called the Undop. And my friend David, who was living there, had a Senegalese girlfriend who had a cousin who was a friend of someone who knew someone, who whole line of connections, who actually performed the Undop. And I said, oh, could I interview this woman who performs the Undop? And I said, yes. And so I went off to interview this woman. And at the end of an hour or so of interviewing her, I said to her, is there any chance I could ever actually see an Undop? And she said, well, I've never had a foreigner. The local word was Tubab. I've never had a Tubab at a... Uh, such an event before. She said, but if you wanted to observe an undop, I, I'm sure we could arrange that. We have these friends in common. Yes, we could do that. And I said, that's fantastic. When will you next be performing one? And she said, oh, sometime in the next six months. <laughs> and I said, six months is quite a long time for me to be here just waiting for someone. I said, are there any that could be expedited? And she said, no, it doesn't really work that way. So I said, oh, well. And I was just leaving. And she said, um, before you go, she said, I I hope you don't mind my saying this. And I said, yes. And she said, you don't look so great yourself. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, oh. And she said, I've certainly never done this for a two-bob before, but if you'd like, I could perform an end up for you. And I said, oh, OK. Did you have any sure. idea what you were getting into? Well, I had a vague idea of what I was getting into, because I had just interviewed her for an hour about right, okay. it. But the ritual varies enormously depending on who's performing it and who is the person on whom it's being performed and what they determine. And we left, and Hélène, the friend with whom I'd gone there, turned to me and said, are you completely crazy? How can you possibly be doing this? And I said, well, I just think it'll be an interesting research experience. And I won't take you through every detail of it, but the high point of the day came when uh, I was um, put into a makeshift wedding bed in the central square of this village with a ram, and the entire village was dancing around us in concentric circles and throwing sheets of cloth over us. And at a certain key moment, um, the cloth was all pulled off. I was yanked to my feet. The loincloth, which was all that I was wearing, was pulled off of me. Um, the ram's throat was slit, and I was covered in the blood of the freshly slaughtered ram. And I thought to myself, this is a long way from depression treatment <laughs> as practiced in New York City. Um, and uh, there was then this whole business that followed, very complicated and very um, elaborate, in which I essentially went through a form of exorcism. And it was interesting, about five years later, when I was working on my current book, I went to Rwanda, and I was recounting the story to someone in Rwanda. And he said to me, oh, you know, we had a lot of trouble with mental health workers who came here just after the genocide. And I said, oh, really, what happened? And he said, well, he said, they weren't doing what you're describing of taking people out in the sunshine, which is where people get better. Mm -hmm. He said there wasn't a sense that the entire village was taking a day off from their labor in the fields to be focused on the person and try to help them. They didn't externalize the depression as something that had come in from outside and was a spirit that could be removed. He said instead, they took people one at a time and put them in little rooms and asked them to talk for 50 minutes about bad things that had happened to them. 
he said, which obviously just made everyone feel much worse, and we had to put an absolute stop to it. Wow. So I thought, it's all variable. What seems crazy to us makes sense yes. elsewhere. What seems crazy to them makes sense to us. Now, of course, I have to ask, after that whole ceremony, did you feel better? I did actually feel better after that whole ceremony. I mean, partly because I thought, this is going to make the best copy I've ever had. <laughs> there is that, yes. But yeah. also, there was something very inspiring about the focus of this entire village on making me better. That was what they were all doing for that day. They were all right there. They were all right with me. They were all totally focused on it. And I did find the language of it very beautiful. Yeah. I mean, at one point, for example, I had to bury sort of segments of the lamb, and I had to... Um, I had to say things when I did so, and one of the things I had to say was, spirits, I ask that you leave me in peace, and I promise that I will never forget you. And I thought it was a strangely poignant thing to say to demonic spirits that had supposedly invaded me. The theory was that they were actually spirits who were jealous of my real-life sexual partners and that we were mollifying them. I so see. There was a kind of beauty to it, there was a lyricism to it, but there was also an exuberance to it, yeah. which was very thrilling. And you know, exuberance is a pretty good antidote to misery, and it's not used very much in Western treatments for depression. What do you think it was about you that made her suggest that you weren't in the best of shape? There must have been something obvious, I would think, or was there? Was she just intuitive? I think she was just intuitive, but I was writing a book about depression, and I think I was probably stressed out and exhausted mm. and all of the other things that one is. I was not at the low point of my depression. If I had been, I would never have made it to Africa, and I wouldn't have been in that situation. Yeah. But I think she could tell that I was not feeling, you know, glowingly my very best. Yeah. You suffer from depression for how long? You know, depression is a lifetime's mm. occupation. Yeah. So. My first really serious episode was in 1994, but in retrospect I can say there were small precursor episodes, even though I didn't recognize them as such at the time. And I've had waves of depression ever since. I take medication, it requires a lot of management. I actually had a bit of a depression when I published my most recent book and took me much of this winter to pull out of it. Really? So okay. it's an ongoing issue. Okay. This, uh, um, you, you've talked, I read this quite long interview that you did not too long ago with a Mormon publication which I thought was just a riveting interview. And, and there are parts of, of that that I want to ask you about because I just thought that there was, you, you gave so much of yourself in that interview uh, um, and your life is so unique to the vast majority of people that I have to ask you about that as well. But you talked in that interview about your mother and about, the, about your parents' uh, lack, initially lack of acceptance of the fact that you were a gay man. Uh, and that your mother had said something to you that stayed with you for a very long time, right up to her, to her death. Talk a little bit about that and what that did to you. Remind me what well, I Well, when your mother saying. said, she talked about when she got cancer, when she was diagnosed with cancer, and she talked about how stress can cause cancer, and the most stressful thing in her life was the relationship you had with your partner at the time, a man by the name of Michael, I believe. Yes. Um, I... I think that I had struggled a lot with my parents' lack of acceptance of me as a gay person. And I had confused it for a long time with the lack of love. Mm -hmm. And later on, I came to think that my parents really did always love me. There was no real question about that. But they struggled to accept me. I was different in ways that made them anxious and uncomfortable. There was a point shortly after my mother was diagnosed with ovarian cancer when she was angry at the world. And she said to me, you know, stress contributes to cancer and it's been so stressful for me that you're gay and that you're in a relationship with someone and that you're living with him. And I was very angry at her about saying it and she subsequently apologized for mm -hmm. it and said it's not true and I should never ever have said it. But it felt very poisonous to me. I felt as though she was suggesting that who I was was responsible for her being sick and dying. Yeah. It was a, that that's was a, a terrible that's quite time. A, that's, that's a load to bear when your mother tells you something like that. How long between her saying that and her retracting that was that period of time? I mean, a year and a half, maybe, something like that? No, she retracted it. She initially retracted it fairly quickly, oh, I would did. say within okay. a few weeks. Right. Um, we were sort of past that. Yeah. And I, in retrospect, understand that when she was in that rage at her own body for the betrayal that is cancer, that she lashed out. She lashed out at all of us yes. for a little bit. Um, yeah. It had been very shocking. She was very sick. She was to die within less than two years. Yes. So. Um, and then she returned frequently to apologizing for it. But it was an explosive moment, and it did reveal how 
uncomfortable and anxious mm -hmm. she was about my being gay, uncomfortable with it because she didn't want to be the mother of a gay son, uncomfortable with it because she thought the most important thing in life was having children and she thought I wouldn't have children, um, uncomfortable with it at a whole variety of yes. levels. And, and, the, well, and you've talked about that too in, in other interviews and I want to ask you about it because I think that it's, it, it, it is something I think that will give and does give a lot of hope to a lot of people who, who are living in the gay community and, and may have the, the exact same feelings. When your mother said the joy of having children, all these things, which she assumed you would never have, and now you've got them in spades, <laughs> don't you? I mean, everything that she said, you actually have as a gay man. You know, when I was little, my mother used to say to me, the love you have for your children is like no other feeling in the world, and until you have children, you don't know what it's like. And I was very moved by her saying that. It meant she so loved my brother and me. And then I got to be an adolescent, and I began to think, but... I think I might be gay and so I might not have children. And she continued to say it and I was made very anxious by it. And then as I got a little older than that and came out of the closet when she said it, it made me furious. And I said, I'm gay and that's not what I'm doing and I'm on a different path. And then the world changed and it turned out it was possible for gay people to have children. And the tension I had felt all those years between being true to myself and uh, being gay and having a family, which was something that I enormously wanted to do, was no longer a tension. It was possible to do both. Mm -hmm. And I ended up uh, having children in these various elaborate ways. And I thought when I had them, oh, my mother really was right. The love you have for your children is like no other feeling in the world. And until you have children, you don't know what it's like. And angry though it has sometimes made me that she said that, I feel it's the thing that energized me to go forward and try against yes. the odds to have a family which is the greatest thing I ever did. So I'm very grateful to her in the end for that. Now we have to, and I hate to do this to you because I know you've had to do it so many times, but, but it, is, it is necessary because as you said, having children in all these elaborate ways as you, <laughs> as you put it, uh, you have, you were sitting here in New York, you have just come from Fort Worth, Texas where you were visiting your daughter. So um, tell me, you, you were married, your husband has two children, so, <coughs> well, okay, yeah, you explain it. I, I won't even try. Yes. So, my husband, John, is the biological father of two children with some lesbian friends in Minneapolis. Right. Those children are Oliver and Lucy, and they're now 9 and 12. I then had a good friend from college who had gone through a difficult divorce and wanted to have a family, and I said I would feel privileged to have a family with her, and so she and I have a daughter, and mother and daughter live in Fort Worth, Texas, and mother is named Blaine, and our daughter is named Blaney, also named Blaine. And then John and I have a son who lives with us all the time, of whom I am the biological father, and our surrogate for that pregnancy was Laura, the biological mother of John's two children in Minneapolis. <laughs> so the shorthand is five parents of four kids okay. in three states. Okay. <laughs> so now, how, now I've seen I've seen the, the the pictures of you all together, and and it seems like a very joyous and loving group of people. But but how? I mean, you have a daughter in Fort Worth, and her mother is in Fort Worth. Is everybody else sort of in the same ambit of New York? Do you see each other frequently? Is there? And John's two children and their mothers are in Minneapolis. They're in Minneapolis, and okay. And Lane and Blaney are in Texas. Okay. And uh, John and George and I are in New York. So there is some traveling involved. So there is traveling involved. But we all see each other frequently. I would say we see each other about once every other month. Sometimes all of us together. Sometimes I just go and see Blaney or um, John and I just go and see Oliver and Lucy. Um, or they come to visit us. This summer, um, Blaine and Blaney will come for 10 days, and Oliver and Lucy and their moms will come for uh, two weeks, and there's an overlap of about five days in the middle when we'll yeah. all be together. We manage all to see one another on a pretty regular basis. I, it's, it's quite astonishing to be, and, it, and, it, and it, as I said, it does look like a joyous family unit. You know, the logistics can be very inconvenient of having a scattered <laughs> family. Sure. But the emotion actually seems to work very well. Yeah. We all had thought about it a lot. This was not a matter of a family accidentally occurring after a night of fashion. We mm -hmm. went to great lengths to have these children, and they're lovely children, yes. as all parents seem to think their children are lovely children. They've been a source of great joy. You and John uh, had great long discussions, I, I understand, before you became the biological father of Blaney. Yes. He had some, he had some worries initially, did he not? 
I think he was worried that I was creating an emotional bond in Texas that would somehow triangulate our own relationship. Mm -hmm. And I said, but you already have two children with uh, Tammy and Laura. And he said, I was the donor for those children. I am not the father of those children. They don't have my last name. They don't count on me as a parent. But ironically, what happened was that after Blaney was born, and it turned out that she was going to call me daddy and call John Papa, they then said, uh, Oliver and Lucy said that they really would like to call us the same things. And we had grown so close to Laura while she was carrying George. And one way or another, it emerged that even though we aren't actually legally or officially the parents of Oliver and Lucy in the way that I am legally the father of Blaine and John and I are legally the parents of George, still they became very important in our lives and we all ended up being much more entangled than I think any of us had anticipated. Yeah, I, I mean, as you were saying that, I'm thinking, you know, I just recently had to go through a very elaborate legal proceedings to rearrange my will for my two now grown children and so on. And I, and I just started thinking, boy, what you guys are going to have to go through to figure out who's going to get what. I mean, it's, it, it, the mind boggles. And you must have given that some thought. I have, um, and I have spent time working on, um, on a will. As I said, Oliver and Lucy are not legally our children, right. so we love them a lot, but it's a somewhat different relationship yes. from the relationship with Blaine and with George. But additionally, figuring out things like a will is very complicated because John and my marriage is still not recognized by the federal government. It looks like we may be getting to the point at which that changes, but when I was figuring everything out, there was the sense that you know John was legally considered a stranger to me, Blaine and George are legally considered my children, but John is the person I'm spending my life with. The mix of the legalities and the practicalities and the realities is, it's weird. It's yes. just been very, So your very marriage weird. is recognized by the state of New York, but not by the federal government of the right. United States of America, essentially. Exactly. Yeah, go the irony. Um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about, about all of this was going on, I guess, while you were researching the book that's out now, Far From the Tree, which is about this idea of acceptance and about parents who have children that are different from them. And it's a, a, it's a riveting book, and I would recommend it to anybody. It's the, uh, and, you. And, and you were a very good writer in that sense, so it's a joy to read. But, but I'm curious about how those, how, what was going on in your personal life, because I understand it was 10 years of research. Is that right? 11. 11 years of research, even more. So, so all of these things were happening sort of simultaneously, and there had to be, I, I would think, spillover from one to the other as you're going out and interviewing people who are living lives that are extremely different from that of their parents and that whole issue of acceptance and everything must have had an impact on what was going on in your own life at the same time. The book I was working on is about how families respond to children who are strikingly different from them in some way, who have an identity that's alien to the parents. So families of deaf people, of people with dwarfism, Down syndrome, autism, schizophrenia, with multiple severe disabilities, families of prodigies who are also quite overwhelmed, families of uh, people who commit crimes, families bringing up children conceived in rape, and families of people who are transgender. And the whole message of the book ended up being a message of acceptance, and it was my struggling to get to that point of acceptance that, um, that really drove me forward. Mm -hmm. While I was working on the book, I met John just before I began on the book, and it was while I was working on the book that we began discussing having this expanded notion of family. And people said to me, but how can you be thinking of having children? How can you have the courage to have children when you're in the middle of a book about everything that can go wrong? And I had to say over and over again, it's not a book about everything that can go wrong. It's a book about how much love there is even when everything goes wrong, how much joy there can be even in difficult experiences of parenting. And I think it gave me the, the energy and the conviction that whatever children we had and whatever challenges we faced, we would be able to construct a loving yes. family. You know, it's interesting because you said earlier that you, you experienced a bout of depression after the publication of this book, and yet, f judging from what you've just said about discovering, in fact, that having talked to all these people in all these some, sometimes quite horrific circumstances, that there seems to be that the, the, the hope and optimism there, that you, you would think that perhaps you would come out of it feeling differently than that. I think I felt very hopeful and optimistic about life altogether as I was working on the book. But publishing a book is a very naked experience. Yeah. My mother died the week that my first book was published. My second book was published and made me feel very naked and very exposed. It dealt partly with gay themes, and I felt as though I was coming out of the closet in a more dramatic way. It had already come out to everyone I knew, but somehow I was coming out to the world at large. My third book was about depression, and ironically, I didn't get depressed when that one came out. Um, and in fact, I met John a couple of weeks after that was published. 
this book had taken so many years and it had required the trust of so many people and I had plunged so deeply into so many lives and the idea of letting um, all of that go out into the world and face the judgment of the world was kind of terrifying to me. And it spoke very intimately both about my experience of being the gay child of straight parents and about the unorthodox way in which I'd formed a family. Mostly I had incredible support, but I had weird right-wing le- uh, websites saying that everything I'd done was evil and terrible and bizarre. Oh. It was just a feeling of being very exposed, yes. and being very exposed can be very stressful, even though I had longed to have the book completed and out there. Yeah. And then I got past it, but that initial period was yeah. very overwhelming. Okay, all right, that makes sense. Uh, you have talked about the importance of the, the, the marriage to John and, and the ceremony, and... and uh, and I've read the words that you've said about the ceremony and what it meant to the two of you and, and what it meant to, to, to your family as well. Um, uh, was it John's sister who at the last minute, uh, a sister who was not terribly enamored with the idea of the two of you getting married, but then she asked to speak at the, at the wedding and you let her and it was a surprising development, wasn't it? It was. I wouldn't say that she was less than enamored with our getting married. I would only say that she had grown up in a very Catholic household and that she had some Catholic conservative values and that we weren't sure that she would feel comfortable with what was happening and we therefore hadn't asked her to make a speech. And then when she got there, she said, I'd love to make a a speech um, at the wedding. And John said to me, can we do that? And I said, she's your sister. If she wants to speak, of course we can. And she stood up and she made the most beautiful moving, compelling speech about how much joy it would have given her parents to see John so happily attached to someone and about how much it meant to her to see that her brother's life had worked out all right. And it was, my father spoke, but my father had been a huge supporter all the way through. It meant so much to us that she was able to transcend the context that she lived in, in a small town in the Midwest, in America, in a Catholic family. She was able to see that there was real love there and to celebrate that yeah. with us. It was That's a, true acceptance, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Let me ask you then a little bit, in, in, sort of in, in, along those same lines, uh, a little bit about religion. Because um, you talked, well, in fact, in that interview with the Mormon periodical, you uh, had this quote here from it. You said, the experience of being depressed and emerging from depression made me understand the idea of a soul. And you talked just after that about the death of your mother and and the fact that, uh, that you believe that science may ex- explain a lot of things, but it doesn't explain everything. Uh, you watched your mother die. Uh, you came out of that, I, I guess, with a sense that there, is, there are things that we don't understand. There is something beyond our knowledge. I've had a similar experience, and, I've, and my reaction to it was the exact opposite. My reaction now, just in the last year, has been, I think this is, I think this is it. I don't right. think that there was anything else. But I'm curious, so based on, on my feelings about what happened to me, I'm curious about your feelings when your mother passed away and what came of that for you, how, how you came to that conclusion. I've always disliked dogma, and I've just liked a lot of what's associated with organized religion. And I think organized religion has frequently been used as a tool to create social divisions, especially in this country as I've grown up here. Mm-hmm. That being said, I felt at my mother's death, much as I felt at the birth of my children, that these things seem to me to be monumental and beyond our understanding. It's not that I have any understanding of them or I have a sense of what it is that's beyond our understanding. I just thought my mother was in the room and suddenly she wasn't there. And it seemed impossible to me that there wasn't some deeper or bigger or more profound meaning to what had happened. And I feel about my own children that, and I've written about this in the most recent book, it's very difficult for me to believe that if we had conceived them three days later, we would have completely different children and would be equally attached to them. They feel inevitable. They feel like they are my children. They are the people who I was was to love. They are the people who had to come into being. It was a sense somehow of there being an incomprehensibility to things. And I understand um, that the basics of science and you know there are electrons and there are molecules and they sort of are all moving through the universe in their various unpredictable ways but I thought I thought it's hard not to believe that there's some that there's some greater depth to all of this but I don't know what that greater depth is right. I only feel that it's there so you wouldn't say then you were a religious person no I'm would not would you a say that you were person. a spiritual person then would that be the more appropriate word 
you know, I hate the word spiritual because it's come to be associated with sort of new age music and patchouli. Um, crystal sun, <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> um, I think that I just have a sense of the mysteriousness and unknowability of uh, our own human experience or our own experience of the world. How and does that inform your life, or does it? Um, it informs it, I think, quite profoundly. Uh, I think that there's a humility that came out of these experiences, a humility of saying, I don't know why these children exist and other children don't exist. I don't know why I have the family I do. I don't know why I've had the advantages and privileges I've had. I don't know why I face the particular difficulties I have. And I don't know that there's an explanation which could be comprehensible to any of us. I always think of that lovely thing from William James when he describes how um, a dog uh, doesn't understand why you sometimes do things that are unpleasant for, for him, the dog, um, and you're doing them because you have a greater knowledge of what will be good for the dog. And William James said, we're all dogs at the feet of God. Yes. I don't have any very clear sense of who God is or of what God looks like or even whether there is a God. I'm uncomfortable even with that word, God. What I have a sense of is that the human intellect is not sufficient to understand fully the mysteries of the universe. Okay. In our last couple of minutes, then, I just want to get sort of logistical here. When I look at, when anyone looks at your accomplishments and the number of things that you were involved in, the number of boards you sit on, the number of agencies in which you participate, I just thought, how does this guy find enough minutes in the day and then still have these children that he's going to see all over the place? My sense is your, your life must be just one nonstop circus. Is it? <laughs> It does feel very nonstop some of the time, and it feels very overwhelming some of the time. Yeah. But my mother died very young. She was 58 when she died. I'll be 50 in October. I have a sense, and I think I've always had a sense of life as somewhat fragile and of wanting to pack a lot of experience into it. And in the periods when I was depressed, I felt I couldn't do much. I spent a lot of time in my room with the windows um, uh, shut and the curtains drawn. And now I feel as though if I'm feeling well enough to be engaged in life, I want to be fully engaged in yeah. it. Balancing the work piece of it and the children piece of it has required a lot of new negotiation, and I'm still in some ways figuring that out. Writing my book at the same time that I was doing my PhD was not necessarily the most sensible <laughs> way to go forward. But I do have a sense that life has ultimately been kind to me. I have a husband I love. I have lovely children. The books have taken off. It's sort of worked out. And in terms of the boards and so on, I feel if I can give back a little bit to the world, that that would make me feel yeah. a little more as though I deserved the fortune I've had. And what I find intriguing is for someone who has suffered from, and again, this, there will be people watching us who have gone through this very, very thing, and so I, I think this would also give them hope. For someone who has suffered for depression on the continual basis that you have and dealt with it the way you have, you have, you're out there all the time. I mean, you're sitting here doing a television interview with me. You give public lectures. You do all of these very public things, which is, you know, the antithesis of, of, the, of the depressive, who, as you say, wants to be in a room with the blinds closed and the covers over their head. Is that, in a sense, part of your own therapy? Is that, does that help you? You know, there's an element, I'm sure, of being a little bit what's these days called bipolar too. When I've been very depressed, I've been very depressed. And when I'm not very depressed, I'm fairly high energy. Um, but I think also, I think it's hard to explain how debilitating and paralyzing the depression is unless you've been through it. That point when I would get up and think, I need to eat lunch, but it's going to be too much work to get the food out of the refrigerator. That sense that I should take a shower, but I was afraid of the water pounding down on me. The anxiety and the fearfulness and the horror of it were so enormous. But then I thought, the other thing that's really difficult is that you go through these experiences, and they're shameful, and people aren't supposed to talk about them. Mm -hmm. And people said to me, what was it that gave you the energy to be so public about being depressed? And I said, I was very closeted about being gay for a long time, and I knew how toxic it is to be in a closet. And I thought, if I have this illness of depression, I'm going to open up and talk about it, and I'm not going to be in another closet. And in a way, I feel as though the decisions I've made in my life ever since I managed to come out in my 20s have had to do with feeling that while I have a sense of privacy, I don't want to live a life that's marked by secrecy. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, your life is quite remarkable. I am in awe of it. And as I said, the book is fabulous. And I really appreciate you taking the time out of that incredibly busy schedule you have to talk to us. Thank you very it's much. It's been a huge joy. Thank you very much.